recognize a team from uh, George Brown College in Toronto They're here this afternoon. Um, could you kindly stand and be acknowledged, please? Thank you. And thank you very much. They've been here with us for about a week doing some very interesting work, and we really appreciate you, that you are here. But this afternoon, their leader, their thought leader and administrative leader, and a friend of ours and mine, uh, Professor Garvan Furen, who is their president, will give us a, what I expect to be quite a tour de force uh, this afternoon, given his way of thinking about things. He will talk to us about the future of education and work in driving economic growth and development. And this is a very, very significant topic, not only for us here at UG, because we've been discussing this for some time, but also uh, the country and the globe as, as a whole, because of so many kind of disruptions that have happened that are not going to return and settle to where they were before the pandemic. So let me read you, and I'm going to call this very close to my eyes now because I forgot my glasses. Okay, his bio, by way of introduction. Well, it's not a bio, it's a very short summary. Dr. Gervin Furon became president of George Brown College in August 2021. Working with colleagues across the college, he aims to support career-oriented programs to meet the needs of students and the demands of employers. Advanced college level research, uh, enhanced community engagement, etc. With a proven track record of co collaboration, transformative leadership, and engaging higher learning communities in the shared mission, he leads George Brown's efforts to provide transformative education opportunities that benefit learners, industry, and the greater community. Professor Ferran holds a PhD in economics from the University of Western Ontario and received his master's and bachelor's of science degrees in agricultural economics from the University of Guelph. He holds a Chartered Professional Accountant uh, designation, CPA, CGA, and the Institute of Corporate director's designation of ICCD.D. His full biography, and this is by no means what this man is capable of doing, I'm, I'm telling you, um, and, and has done, is available at George Brown University's website. And I would encourage you to please read uh, about him and what he's doing. Because he's very modest. He's not going to come up here and tell you but really and truly, he's been leading some phenomenal work. And we're really delighted this afternoon to hear from him and to welcome him. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a loud round of applause for <laughs> Professor Gervin Firon. Gervin Firon. Well, while this is taking place, I'd just like to make a few comments. Uh, the first item I'd just like to make mention is really uh, in gratitude and in thanks uh, to your amazing vice chancellor, who was the motivator in being able to invite us as a team to take part in learning about the university here, as well as the scope for partnership. And what we've already learned is the incredible capacity of the university, uh, the incredible commitment to students, and the amazing students uh, that are already here and that are here. Uh, I went to school with a number of individuals who graduated from the University of Guyana. Um, they were uh, always outstanding um, students and colleagues who challenged me to be at my best. 
um, and consequently, it's so amazing to come and visit this university to be able to see the place and to know the people from which they came. So it's really pleasing to be here. And as I get started, uh, I'd also like to thank everyone for the hospitality that has been shown uh, to each of us already. Uh, as was made mention um, by the Vice Chancellor, we have uh, quite an interesting topic here uh, to discuss. And the topic, as you can see, relates to the idea of the future of education and work, but not stopping there. Uh, let's think of how that extends into the construct as it relates to economic growth and development. Well, one of the important items then as we think about this, it's a little bit of an outline to provide to you that spans between a little statement about who we are at George Brown, I'll do that very, very quickly, and then get into the body of the dialogue. And what you can see in terms of the body of the dialogue um, is just an interesting walk on a number of factors that's defined and influenced the world um, that we live in. And I think when we think of the world that we live in, the world both in terms of education and in terms of work. But I think if we just stop there, we could ask the question for what objective, the why. Why do we have education? Why do we have work? And ultimately, it relates to economic growth, which relates to prosperity, as well as development, which relates to the distribution of those gains that we gain through economic development as well. So through that, though, um, I'd also like to, as we take a little bit of a walk through, particularly as it relates to work uh, and education, to then loop back and ask the question about economic drivers and how is that showing up in terms of results, and then um, make sure uh, that there's a linkage uh, not only to a broad conceptual framework, um, but how does it all look in terms of the context of the reality as to what's happening um, within Guyana at this time, uh, giving some of, of the most significant developments uh, in this decade. Well, as we uh, made mention, I'd like to just do a very brief uh, statement about George Brown College, and um, here I'll flick through this very quickly so that way you kind of have a little bit of a context um, about who we are as an institution. Well, as an institution, we have um, uh, just uh, under 200 different programs. Um, we have um, over 30,000 students, and as you can tell, some made up in terms of full-time students and part-time students. We have a large number of individuals that are online as well. Uh, so uh, 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 at any given time, over 50,000 individuals uh, online, which means in any given year, we have a touch base of uh, somewhere between 80,000 to 100,000 individuals are taking programs um, with us uh, at any given time. We're the largest uh, downtown college um, in Toronto uh, with three campuses as well. Uh, one of the items then, um, after you start thinking beyond uh, about us, uh, why don't we think about the topic? And as made mention, uh, what I wanted to be able to do is to um, span this idea of the role of education, uh, but to put it in a broader context um, of the trajectory of education over time, the trajectory of work over time. One of the amazing things about economists is quite often when we think about forecasting the future, um, what we generally will say, if you want to forecast the future, make sure you have a good understanding of the past. And consequently, as I take through you in a little bit of a look at the past, remember I'm using that as a platform to pivot us to talk about the future. Well, one of the realities about humanity, um, humanity, and I was talking to some of your faculty members today um, who are in biology, and I was also talking to a faculty member, in fact, the dean of the business school, and I'm actually going to use a language uh, that he made mention. And what he made mention is the requirement of your business school to do two things. One, have a science um, requirement as well as a language requirement. And the statement that he made to us about why a science requirement, he gave the example of biology. 
and the example of biology that living things need to be nurtured to grow. And consequently, if you think of humanity as a whole, we have to have consumption, and consumption is fundamental to our existence, all of us. And that becomes a commonality of any biological being. And that also means that as human beings, we have this incredible challenge as to how do we convert resources into consumables. And that takes place through two mechanisms. One is the technology that we use, the technology in action. And one way of thinking of technology, of course, you can always go and look up sophisticated definitions of technology. However, one simple way of thinking about technology is simply to ask, and the question is, how do you do it? meaning technology is the way by which we do something. And in this case, technology, the way in which we transform resources into consumables. The next part of it, though, is that it's not simply technology in absence. It's technology in line with knowledge. And that then says that technology and knowledge allows us to transform our resources into consumables. And in another way of thinking of transforming into consumables, that is also the economic output of an economy. It's just a matter now who consumes it. Do you consume it or do you export it? So that idea of economic growth is going to automatically be driven by knowledge and technology. But what's interesting is when I stand in the academy, when I stand in the university, when I stand here, you here, you are a part of that mechanism that generates the knowledge of the society to drive forward the technology in transforming resources into consumables or output. And that means then that the university, the college system, is a fundamental driver of economic growth as well as development. And that then says that when we think about that, in that context, the education system, how we work, becomes drivers to economic growth and development, which is exactly our topic. In other words, we're talking about humanity. Well, as made mention, knowledge and technology stand at two sides of that transformation curve. And that also means that the balance between our knowledge and our technology is going to become pivotal in terms of the results that we observe. And that also then means that the university and the college system post-secondary play a really material role in being able to actually not have technology sit on the shelf but making sure that the workforce, that the individuals in society have the training and capacity to use a set of technologies that pre-exist to be able to move forward in terms of getting results. Simultaneously, the interesting thing about technology is that we're in a university setting or a college setting or post-secondary setting. That means that we want to have a critical thinking process to critically look at our technology because that's going to be the mechanism by which we innovate. So the research and development activity of the university is critical then in t transforming or taking technology and moving it forward to be able to do even better at generating the kind of growth and development that will become really important at a broader level. Well, let's just take a look at this for a quick moment. And as I made mention, I wanted to go back before I jump forward. And what you can see here, and I just picked a particular date, um, one of the interesting things about that time period um, is the farming technology that got invented. And uh, a lot of us uh, may think that the plow uh, is something that was always there. Human beings, we invent stuff. So as a result then, um, what's interesting, if you take a look at that uh, line as you develop, that we have the aerospace technology, the railway industry, the service industry of the 1960s, um, so banking and all those financial services. Um, who can forget the dot-com years uh, in that regard? And then we have AI. And in some senses, when we think about this, what's happened as we've had technology in these different sectors develop, every time this development has happened uh, over this time period, it's required more and more knowledge. 
And consequently then, what we see in terms of what's happening at the university system, at the college system, you see that individuals are requiring more and more and more knowledge to be effective in these different sectors. And that then says that as a university, as these sectors transform and evolve, you too are in that process of gaining more and more capacity to be able to actually have the graduates operate in the sectors that exist. And I think that's a really important consideration to keep in tow, meaning that your curriculum has to be constantly evolving, your research has to be constantly evolving, and you're constantly being inundated by external technology that influences how you do what you do. Um, just as a simple statement, um, personal example, and this is, I, I, I don't know how many human beings can say this, um, but I can remember being in a class with a student with a slate, with paper, with a mainframe computer, uh, with a desktop computer, with a laptop, to an iPhone, to a Blackberry, and so on. And I kind of say to myself, oh my gosh, I've lived through all of that, right? That's the past. Just imagine if the future looks anything like that in our, that we experience as part of our past. Well, let's now look at some of the sectors. So that means the idea then, just think of this, that we have seen these different examples of farming over the time period for which I'm talking about. I actually put this tractor up here. As was made mention, I've got two agricultural degrees, I worked on a farm and I used to drive a tractor like that. Yeah, okay? Manufacturing. If you think of the idea of the assembly line and the development of the assembly line, the Industrial Revolution, just want to be careful. Um, we think of the Industrial Revolution. Um, I can tell you when somebody was building the pyramid, there was an assembly line, okay? So, so let's be cautious about when we date these things. But let's just think about that. What that also means is that the way the assembly line developed in manufacturing, that also developed in terms of just-in-time delivery. It also developed that I can order from Amazon or from any other um, uh, platform retailer, and that can get to me. That was all a product of these developments of that time period. Um, you can also see in terms of the idea of the skills trades were so important in order to build the machinery and the mechanisms for which we now take advantage of. Somebody built this platform that I'm standing on, somebody built these facilities that I'm standing in, all of that became and represent a component of manufacturing, and that means our education system have to be able to train people to be able to do these things to manufacture if we're going to transform our resources into consumables and into values that human beings can define. Well, uh, the digital uh, sector. Uh, quite often we think of the digital sector as being a real current item. Uh, 1950s technology right here. Uh, I used to do mathematical programming. I did mathematical programming in an IBM 370. Guess what I used? I used cards. How many people here ever use cards in computer programming? I got one. So I can remember that when I was in high school, a really amazing job that you could get just out of high school if you did typing was key punching. Sorry. Make sure I get this. Ah, there we are. It was key punch operators. So key punch operators, because the computer programmer would write the program, and the key punch operator would write it on the card, you'd run the card, and you'd run the program. That meant for one computer scientist, you would have maybe 20 or 50 key punch operators. And that meant that the digital industry, when it first came on board, it actually increased employment. But what also happened when we had the technological move in the digital industry from key punch operations and from cards to 
desktop computers, it meant that that technological shift made obsolete a whole series of individuals in industry. And what that tells us, again, we're looking at history, it means our education system cannot only train people for the job of today, but it has to train individuals for a resiliency for the dynamics of the economy of the future. And that also means then that the idea of having a scientist do some liberal arts, having somebody in the liberal arts doing a science program, that mixing means that what you're doing is you're actually generating individuals who have a broader breadth of knowledge and capacity to be able to deal with all kinds of changes that will take place over time in their lifespan, in their world, because we've already seen it in our world looking backwards. What it also means when you think of the idea of the workplace and the workplace culture, the assembly line construct the manufacturing construct really infused itself in terms of how we taught and how we thought about how academy and academic institutions should run. We almost thought of the idea of the printing out graduates. So they were all sitting in a big auditorium. And I can remember teaching in a big large auditorium with 300 students, and your job in terms that you were instructed on as a professor was class management. And class management meant that they should keep quiet and stay attentive to you, the genius at the front. Well, I can tell you, if you're teaching in any class today, they have a laptop, they have a phone, they're doing all kinds of items. That means that that assembly line kind of model might not work. You might be talking about something and somebody Googles it and says, I think your reference is wrong. That means the humility that you need to have in terms of the workplace culture has to be one that's radically different. Again, the changes in technology and know-how has influenced our workplace as instructors, as professors, as faculty, as staff, and it's something that we need to pay attention to in that sense. Well, so what was cool is if I was doing this talk 20 years ago, I would stand up here, I'd kind of strut across, and I would go, the digital revolution is coming. And that would be, everybody would stand here or sit here and go, oh my gosh, the digital revolution is coming. I wonder what it means. What's interesting is it's come, it's had an impact, and it's almost passed. So let's look at what it did. Well, what's interesting about the digital revolution is that the digital revolution, it was the application of technology that we had already established. It was just not infused or underpinned every single thing that we do now. So the digital revolution, digital technology, now it wasn't like the idea of the computer with cards and IBM 370 and all that type of item. It wasn't creating a new workforce. It was getting infused in every single sector and every single part of our life. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to do a personal confession. I have two phones on me. How many of you at least have a phone? OK, see? Right? So it is just a part of what we do and who we are in whatever we do now. So how does that look? Well, this tractor. I couldn't operate it. Why? Because it's all computerized, and it's operated on GPS. So that means the training I need to be able to be effective at using that tractor is radically different. The flip side of it is that it may just require me to press a few buttons. 
But if I don't have the education, I don't even know what buttons to press. For crop, here you have drones flying over, engaging in agriculture. Again, if we don't have the education, we don't have the technology, if our institutions aren't training individuals, aren't adopting the know-how to be able to operate it, it means our agricultural sector cannot be competitive at a global level. Manufacturing, robotics, that means then that now all of a sudden to be competitive at a global level in manufacturing, we need our engineering programs and our programs to integrate robotics into it. And if we don't, it likely means that we can't compete with those societies and those economies that have done it. Our offices and our workplace, remember our offices and workplace before? Now, with desktop computers, it means we can move out of these big flat areas and move into office towers and a huge portion of our workforce is now sitting at a desk. That has a huge impact on workplace culture. And that also means that when we think about the impact of technology, not only does it impact work and the knowledge we require, it also is having an impact on the social culture of our workplace. Well, just take a look at the university when the digital technology came about. The university had this, remember those big computer labs with all kinds of computers? And then the classroom was all fixed and structured. We had moved beyond the idea of the assembly line, um, but the reason why we had all of these kinds of labs was because it was so expensive for somebody to have their own laptop. So we were making sure that individual had access to that technology. The challenge is that a lot of universities, a lot of societies then, when they moved to this technology, it was almost obsolete. And you might say to me, um, where am I talking about? Well, a read of the Ontario budget, and I've read all the Ontario budgets from the 1950s all the way up to 2015. Why? Um, other people read novels. I guess I've just described what I read. One of the interesting items in the 1980s was that there was a real big push to get technology in schools. So what they did, they spent millions and millions of dollars getting televisions in the classroom. And when I started to lecture, I can remember at one of the universities that I used to lecture, there was a, a couple of big television screens that hung from the ceiling uh, in the classroom. By the time they implemented it across the entire education system, televisions in the classroom were obsolete, but they spent millions of dollars doing it. And what that tells you about technology and the rate of technological change and investment strategy in universities and colleges is that we have to be so very careful about investing in technology for our workplace when that technology may already be obsolete. But it also gives you an opportunity if you have not invested in that technology because you don't have the fixed asset, that fixed cost to maintain it. So in fact, not investing allows you the scope to leapfrog if you can actually figure out where to jump to, right? Well, as made mention, the digital technology was here. And just before COVID, I think I would have had one kind of dialogue with you. COVID happened and it changed humanity. Because all of a sudden, what happened with COVID is it said to us, we can't be in space together. And what that meant though, is because we had digital technology, we started to ask ourselves, how do I think through how we use digital technology? And what that meant is that the classroom now looked like this. We had in one class, as even this dialogue right now, there are some people who are here, there are some people who are online, there are some people who will actually take, 
take the same information from home and may actually see it a week from now. That means that how we share and transfer information radically changed. It also meant that our classroom, how they looked, they needed to have the flexibility for being able to acknowledge that people might be physically here or might not be here, impacting not only our workplace as post-secondary educational institution, but also our culture. What we also know as well is that it didn't stop at the classroom because all of a sudden what you found out was that people were staying at home for almost two years and then one day you woke up and you said it's safe to come back, everybody come back to the office. And everyone says to you, why? And it's a really interesting item. You know, I've been president of two universities, a college, and you know, you almost want to say, you know, when I say, come back in. I don't think what I wanted to hear was why, right? But it was even stronger. What you heard was, are you kidding? <laughs> then you start to, you know, um, by the way, I said I have Caribbean parents. My parents are Jamaican. So, you know, there's a piece of that DNA. So I say, you're going to come in. And they say, can't make me. And I go, hold on one second. All of a sudden, I realize they're right. I can't make them come in because they're getting their job done and they're meeting the requirements by being at home. And consequently, COVID changed the social contract between employer and employee. And it also changed the relationship and the workplace culture. And that then says that if we stayed the way it was, then we would have offices without people and people not caring for offices. So, what does that mean? We needed to actually ask ourselves, do we want to have empty classrooms, empty offices, or were we going to start to change? Were we going to have simulation where individuals could do simulation from anywhere? That's one of our, our simulation labs for our um, health study and nursing students. Uh, where we're going to have offices that you have flex space, where you actually book the space and use it, store some of the materials if you want, so you could actually show up, store your purse, your computer, and so forth, and actually rotate around the space and so forth. Now, if you think that this is radical, um, back here, that little space there, that's my office. So my office is actually in an innovation space. So what I wanted to be able to do was to ask the question, could my office be in an incubation or innovation hub? So that meant that not only did it change how we worked, but it also meant it changed who we could work with and how we use space. And that was a combination of the digital and COVID. If it was only the digital, we might not be here, but the combination has been a bit of a revolution. What it also meant, that it means that we need to have the enabling technologies. So the idea of, um, by way of, of example, you might, be, you might want mics built into your spaces. You might need um, different technologies to be able to have meetings and so forth. So it meant that the technologies that are now in the space had to also evolve to be able to do this. Some of the other offices, so this is an office that we have. This is an actual office that we have that looks like this. And this space we've dedicated specifically to what we call the future of work. The entire space, uh, there are no fixed offices. And that means that we have people who can flex and come in one day a week or so forth, which means what would normally be one office for one person is now one office for five or even 10 people. So the space needs, because we're in downtown Toronto, space is really expensive. 
how we use space then is completely different. But it, it's not only because of digital technology, it's digital technology and COVID. Um, we've got these nice little cubicles. It's like a telephone booth if you really want to have one of those private conversations, um, you know. So when you get one of those calls that you don't recognize and they start telling you that your um, visa hasn't, you know, um, there's some overdraft, you can go in there and likely say, I don't think this is true because I don't have that card. Um, but in other words, this is what you do for private conversations and the likes. Um, this is interesting because it's something that you might not necessarily automatically think about. So what happens is that we go through COVID, future of work, individuals are working three, four days a week at home. And remember, when they're at home, they're actually engaged in work activities. And that means that they're using the chairs they have. That also means workplace injury, liability, is now directly related to work. So that then says, as an employer, in terms of thinking of working at home and how you use space, individuals might not recognize that ergonomic becomes really important. And it's also important then to have training programs to actually train people on how to work from home. And somebody might say, why? Well, in the workplace, you don't sit in your chair for eight hours. And that means then the idea of training individuals to actually engage in the kind of mobility and flexibility becomes really fundamental. Being able to have a time in the day where online you have an exercise program is really important. Because what you're basically doing is that you have to ask yourself all those functionalities in terms of physical engagement that you take place when you are in the workplace, walking up the stairs, walking to get lunch, doing all those items. How do you actually make sure that the health and well-being of your workers are actually being reflected? All of those items means that the idea of the future of work also means a future of obligation of employers. And I would actually say it's a shared obligation. Well, the impact of digital as well as COVID didn't stop there. It means that in classes, learning management systems became really important because you've got to be able to have all your curriculums and courses now um, in a distributed learning item. It also meant that the idea of where your students located um, is now dynamic as well. They don't have to necessarily be right near you. However, I would caution, quite often people start saying, well, that means that we could just have one global university that's all online. It turns out that the reality is, is online learning. Most people, at least in Canada and the US, live within 70 kilometers of a physical university even when they're doing online. And what we found with our students is even when they're doing online, they show up at the, at the college in the, to be able to sit together and talk about materials and access some of the services. So online doesn't necessarily mean that you don't need student space and student engagement. Um, online library, journals, um, registration systems and management systems and feedback systems, um, booking systems for our offices, uh, meeting spaces, and so forth. In other words, the idea of technology and digital revolution as it impacts uh, the academy has a filtering way through on all of our systems and all of our processes. Well, right about now, um, even if this was five years ago, I could stop. I could, you know, my daughter would tell me I could plie. Um, and, um, and by definition, um, that would be the end of my dialogue. But that's not where we are. Here's the wonder of artificial intelligence. So let's start looking at this. 
what's interesting about it is the history of artificial intelligence goes all the way back to the 1950s. Um, I suspect um, that if I dig deep enough, I can find a manuscript from Leonardo da Vinci that says Leonardo da Vinci invented artificial intelligence, right? <laughs> um, it's, by the way, that's my definition of humor, okay? Um, but artificial intelligence, all the way up to the 1990s, actually demanded more knowledge, more capacity. And as a result, it was much like digital in the sense that it added to employment. Like you just needed more knowledge, more information to be able to do it, remember that. However, more recently, uh, what we saw in terms of deep learning, in terms of machine learning, in terms of Bayesian statistics, and I was talking to a statistician today, um, all of those items meant that we've gotten to the point where artificial intelligence allows us to actually just say, speak, it recognizes speech. It now recognizes image. And that created a revolution. So we would have thought that with artificial intelligence, what was going to happen is that it was going to actually cause a stacking up of knowledge needed. Everything was going to have to train up. Well, as I made mention in terms of speech recognition, in terms of being able to write recognition, all those items, that's a development. So already by that time period, it was already exceeding the average capacity that we had. And what that meant then is instead of adding to what's needed, it now has actually done for the first time in history, it is now knowledge saving. Before, technology was labor saving, capital saving. Now this is knowledge saving. So that means anyone in a knowledge related industry, a technology that now saves the knowledge you need to be effective. The accountant no longer needs to do a lot of the analysis. The stockbroker doesn't need to do a lot of the analysis. The medical doctor doesn't need to do a lot of the diagnosis. Now, artificial intelligence might actually be better at doing a diagnosis than a medical doctor. That means how you train those individuals is radically different. And that means as well that that technology is also going to have an impact on the distribution of income across society. Well, as made mention, this is kind of the world we look at, live in. So should the doctor sit there and do the diagnosis, or should it just turn it over to artificial intelligence? And on that, should we turn justice over to artificial intelligence? And what does it mean about justice if algorithms have biases? So a lot of moral questions. What it also means, though, in the workplace of the university and the college, it also means the first question is, if there's an essay that's being written from a pedagogy point of view, do you allow the student to use artificial intelligence in writing the essay? You have to make a decision. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, the question was, do you allow the student to use a calculator? See? Not so dissimilar. Academic integrity. Um, the best one for me was when somebody told me that over the weekend they had written five research proposals for grants. And I said, I said, how did you do that? They said, are you kidding me? Chat GBT. <laughs> well, what happens if they get them? Like, I don't know. Like, does it mean that they can do it or can't do it? And if they do get it and do the grant and get ChatGBT to write the paper, does that mean they get tenure? I don't know. But we will need an answer because people will be doing it. 
innovation. One of the amazing things about technology quite often has impacts that we don't think of. And at first, we are scared of it, but quite often, it does drive the value proposition because humans apply technology and knowledge to get results. So I don't doubt that we will figure that out. Property rights. Uh, the big one in the arts, if I ask artificial intelligence to give me a drawing on something and I paint it, replicating it, is it my art? And can I then copyright it? I don't have an answer, but I'm just saying, as a university, as the academy, I think we better start trying to figure it out. Because we're just at the leading edge before somebody starts doing it. Well, so far, I've been maybe a little in the clouds. And what I'd like to do is to bring it closer to where we are, to Guyana. Well, I think without question, we have a real understanding that there are a set of drivers of the economy as shown. We know that the education system is integral in terms of being able to generate a set of economic outcomes and sectors and driving sectors. And we know that what's been significant for the Guyanese economy uh, is the idea of a natural resource-based driven economy as well. Along with that, we shouldn't leave, leave too far behind the idea of the social contract or governance. And with that, as I go through, you'll see what I mean very quickly. Well, some data, and um, this is the source of where I got those data from. Uh, just take a look at what has happened to per capita GDP growth for Guyana in, this is, think of that, three to four years, it's actually increased by almost 300%. There's almost no other country in the world that can say that they've seen that. That's radical. That increase in GDP means that Guyana at this level is now, can be cast as, if you, could, if you want to think of it, a high income country, right? Yeah. Now. It doesn't mean the distribution is there, but that's the per capita income that's there. Well, a very small population, and what that also means is that the training of the, every individual in the workforce and everyone in the society is going to be fundamental in order to be able to maintain the capacity to drive that economic growth and that wealth creation that's happening. If you take a look at the unemployment rate, notice the interesting thing. It is not dropping anywhere as fast as the economic growth is taking place. And that means that the economic growth is not necessarily a broad-based inclusive growth. And that means that it's really important to differentiate and why the title is economic growth and economic development. Economic development relates to distribution. Economic growth is just what's happening on a per capita. Poverty rate, yes, is going down. But again, over the same time period, it's definitely not declining at the same pace of the rate of economic growth. Well, another way to think of this, and this is courtesy of uh, the Center for Local um, Business Development, and um, had an opportunity to meet uh, with the, some of the amazing people there. When you take a look at some of the data that they've got from a recent report, um, what we notice um, is in terms of what's needed over the next five years, uh, notice that over the next five years, 
over 50,000 individuals are needed in these sectors. And that means as the amazing institution for the country, that means that that has to be part of your mandate as to how do you actually contribute to that. Well, when you take a look at some of the sectors, what's interesting about it <clears throat> is that education is one of the top skills that's needed, along with technical skills, but that's for our culture. Uh, notice here, in terms of construction, uh, the technical skills and experience, and then education. Uh, when you take a look at the oil and gas, education, and interpersonal skills. Uh, what's amazing about that? Well, guess what? If you're out on a rig, working with people, um, close quarters, I think you better emphasize interpersonal relations. Logistics, interpersonal, because you need to problem solve, and education and experience. Notice in almost every single one of these, education is number two. Okay. Or, in other words, it is the consistent dominant item for every single one of the sectors. Well, what that means then is that the idea of the university or the college is going to be really important in research and development. And when I say that, I want to be really careful about that. Um, as made mention, I used to be president of a couple of universities, and I remember moving to the college system, and somebody told me about applied research. And I scratched my head because I just said there's only research. Um, and what I was getting at about that is that ultimately research and innovation is about solving problems. And that then says if by some chance your institutions aren't involved in being able to solve relevant problems of the society, then the institution becomes detached from being able to add to the capacity of the society. Careers we talked about, that also means that it's not just the university that's going to be a part of the solution. Vocational skills and training will be important. Career training will be important. Entrepreneurship will be important. All of which will become important in driving economic growth and development. Well, coming close to an end, challenges. What can I say? What makes us stronger? Tension, challenges. So don't look at this with fear. Look at this with this amazing sense of zeal because overcoming them means that we're stronger. So just a wide range. Slow population growth, but a huge uh, labor force need. Uh, climate change, of course, it'll be affecting you. I want to touch on this. I listened to the prime minister, um, sorry, Canadian president, um, speak about um, gangs, not just here, but I would say globally. We globally feel this. We feel it in Toronto, we feel it in Canada, we feel it globally. So this is not about some of us, it's about all of us. And what I'd just like to be able to say here is that we, in post-secondary, we have to make sure that we're contributing to the value proposition that individuals are getting from our public institutions in a greater manner than the value propositions offered by gangs. Because you can't, what individuals are making a choice on is literally over the value proposition that's delivered to them. It may not be the only thing, but I can tell you it is part of that calculus. Um, again, um, I made mention here um, about health and longevity. Uh, really important to make sure, again, that there's a distribution of those benefits. Uh, down here, um, there are all kinds of other items that we'll be developing. Uh, next, in terms of some opportunities, uh, a whole range of opportunities, um, but one of them that I want to emphasize 
uh, was the idea of institutional partnership. And that means that over the time for which I've been here, the idea of having dialogue around institutional partnership has been really grand. And you could take a look and read through um, each of the, that list. And I know there will be questions, so you can take the time through that to ask about any of those specifics afterwards. Um, lastly, one of the things that I um, asked and I have to actually admit I didn't do this, so it's my um, good uh, colleague, um, Maya. I asked Maya to ask ChatGBT this question. Please thank the audience for listening to my presentation in a futuristic manner. And take a read of what it said to summarize my talk. So that statement came from chat GBT. Okay? Not me. That was artificial intelligence thanking you for being the audience here today. And with that, I'd like to thank you. And what I wanted to do is this is me thanking you. The problem is what happens when AI thanks you in a code that you can't understand? Thank you so much. Yes, of course, so you're free to ask your questions. Um, please, who's going first? Okay. Any questions? Please raise your hands. Well, I have always been told that if you fall over a cliff and somebody falls over a cliff, what you do is you yell and say, is anybody there? The only time you should worry is when they don't answer. <laughs> right? So questions, absence of questions causes me to worry. Well, I, I'm not going to, it, it causes anybody who is a, who is a, an academic and a thinker to worry. So thank you very much for a very, I'm sorry, AI. AI. <laughs> Um, thank you very, very much for what is a very fascinating uh, journey through many of the things I think we've been thinking about. And as I sat here uh, and listened to you, there are two questions that you answered that a young man who shall remain nameless, otherwise he's going to not be happy that I, I named him, asked me recently. And one of them, and actually just last night, one of the questions was, why go to college? You know, what, why, what, 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 what is, is important about going to college or going to university? And I think this question, uh, I actually wrote it down. Um, the, the answer was, you will require more and more knowledge as you go forward to be effective in life. And perhaps you can't only get it from uh, your friends on social media or from randomly, you know, um, picking out uh, YouTube things that you might be interested in and that YouTube or other sites may um, be offering to you. So I really want to thank you for that answer, which I could say is not my answer, but yours. And I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of young people who, are, who have this question about why do they have to come to a university or a college and spend two or three years uh, to do anything, um, why, why that's the case. Now, I would like to, um, I'd like to go back to your essential premise, I, what I think is your essential premise, that um, 
the education that we're delivering now is going to be obsolete by, by the time we deliver it. Is that what you said? I, uh, why kind don't of? I wait till the end and then I'll respond? Okay. Um, well, what I gathered from what you would be saying, and I actually believe that, is that there is such a hyper disruptiveness going on and an acceleration of technology and the amount of knowledge that is being created at a short space of time is that as soon as we're actually be able, as soon as we actually, it, it actually arrives, it, it almost is obsolete. And therefore it means to me um, that if we are going to do three, four, five year degrees, by the time that we're done, by the time that person graduates, perhaps they're not going to be uh, fit for the world that they're emerging in. So the question I want to ask you is what do we do about that? Thank you for the question. And maybe what I'll um, say is the first premise is exactly right. The rate at which knowledge is being generated, that anything that we're teaching about what we think we know there's likely a paper or a research or something that's challenging any construct that we think we know. So in a sense, we're teaching what we knew uh, in that sense, as opposed to what we know or what we m will know um, by the time our students graduate. The next part of it, though, is the process by how we acquire the knowledge and how we think about the knowledge. That process doesn't become obsolete. The, so the process of the desire to learn, how we learn, how we apply what we learn, how we use that in different situations, means that our education system now needs to teach more about the processes that have a longevity as opposed to teaching the idea that this is a fixed set of knowledge that you're at. I can remember doing the multiplication tables. and at which point you think learning the multiplication tables meant that you know how to do math. No, I knew how to I memorize the multiplication table. Today, I need to actually understand what is multiplication and to be able to understand the idea in math of multiplication to addition in that sense. So almost set theory. So in that sense, if I understand how I think about something, um, that gives me the resiliency. The second part of my answer, though, is a question that I remember being asked some time ago. And I was being asked to give a talk on the future. And I gave the talk, and at the end of it, somebody said to me, how could you predict the future? And I said, because the future has already happened. And they thought that that the future, because for example, we know that in the lifetime of our students, humanity is likely to not only live on Earth, but on the moon. We know that already. We know that our cars, carbon-based cars, will likely not be used that they'll be more electric based. We know that. So that then says, and I'll use a Canadian example, the regulation already requires by 2030, and in California by 2030, a huge portion of electric vehicles. So we already know our electric grid can't take the load of the electric vehicles. The question is, are we actually training people to be able to actually upgrade the electric grid? So in a sense, we already know today the future. Our big challenge in the education system is to try to help people to actually do something about it. So in a sense, I agree with you. We are teaching old knowledge, but the process um, can also always be new, and we do know, know a few things about the future because we've already set a few things in motion uh, in that sense. So, the, yeah. 
Thank you for the question. Thank you, um, Professor. Um, any other question? All right. So thank you for the presentation. So you spoke about the future workplace. And there is a challenge here, like, like some, any organization wants to be able to share the space. People, they think that oh, whoever has the space, they own it. This is my office, this is my place, this is my desk. Nobody should share it with me, it's, my, it's mine, it's mine. And this is the barrier. So what suggestion that you would give that for people to overcome this barrier? So I'd like to maybe answer that in two ways uh, because we see that behavior in the workplace and when I say we see it, by definition, if we see it, it likely means that I do it too, okay? So, so you know, quite often we say we see others doing it without recognizing the degree to which we do it ourselves, right? I go to this, it's a small office that I use, but I still go to that same space almost every day, so I do that. But I think I would actually say, if you put it as space and information, then it starts taking on an interesting paradigm. Because at the times as well, individuals feel not only do they have to hoard or keep space, they also want to keep information. So the behavior on what we see in physical space is sometimes very visual. The part in the workplace culture that we sometimes don't see is people actually keeping information. And what that means then is that individuals are underestimating the network value of sharing. And they're actually not realizing the externality, the spillover effect of sharing. And what I mean by that, if I only use my office one day a week and I lock the door, that's one cost structure to the institution. If I use my office one day a week and then four other people use it on the other five days a week of the work week, that means the cost structure to the institution has just radically dropped. And where we had a budget problem before, we don't. Where we would have to lay off people, we don't. Where we didn't have money for investment in research and development, we now have. So what's happening is that the individual isn't taking their behavior and flowing it through the impact they're having on the organization and then bending it back on the impact that when they ask for the computer and somebody says, I can't afford it, they didn't internalize that because they're the only one using the office, they're the ones that now have an obsolete computer. So it is the idea of how do you actually show that value impact and then bend it back that the individual sees it. Um, but I have to say that I think that the big self-examination, self-reflection is to recognize that we all have that tendency. So the question then is, is how do we recognize it and then how do we model what we want to do in leadership and then how do we actually help to kind of take away um, that, that lens in front of people that they could see um, the impacts. Uh, thank you for the question. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, so on the premise of that very question that you just answered, my question would be, how do we teach our students as well as our employees to work effectively remotely, what would be your approaches? Um, because we know that people do work at home, they go cook, clean, sometimes they miss an email. How do we effectively train them, like you said, to work remotely? And also, our children don't want to come into a classroom. How do we effectively teach them to study at home or work online and also taking into account AI, how do we monitor and evaluate those things and also look at um, the property rights and all of that? 
Uh, so there's a, a lot of components to the question. I'll see if I can break down into component parts. Um, the first item about working at home or independently, I might have a, a little bit of an ironic statement. I would say it's how do you teach people to work effectively, period, wherever you are. And part of that then, to me, is actually making sure that there is a clearly defined goal, strategy, impact, desired outcome, as well as process and value proposition that is trying to be delivered within a moral construct or a, a principle construct in that sense. And it may sound like a, a set of ABCDs in that sense, but what I'm getting at is unless individuals are motivated to deliver a value proposition impact, they are likely not working effectively anyway, regardless of where they are. They might be able to show up so you see them, but it doesn't mean that they're being any more effective than if they had just stayed home and not show up and not done anything. So I think the first item I would say is working effectively, period, wherever you are. The second item um, for me, um, as it relates to how do you teach children and support children in being able to work at home or online. And what came to mind as you said that is something my mom said to me. So my mom said to me uh, when I was a, not so much a kid, but kind of a, like a kid, um, she said to me, I can't write your essay for you, but if you read it to me, I'll tell you if it makes sense. She said, I can't do your math for you, but I can keep your company to encourage you to do it. What I'm saying is that ironically, for teaching our children to work effectively at home or online, sometimes we want to be able to give the answer. I would actually say as a parent, um, also recognizing my mom, I would actually say to give them love, whether they succeed or fail, and if you can do that, you can also teach them love for learning. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor. We have another question from Andrew online. He's asking, how are the developed countries and the leading AI companies frontally addressing the growing disparities that exist in accessing these new technologies in the developing countries? Well, access to these technologies in developing countries. I would have to say to most people, and when I say this, uh, my, part of my job is to make sure I survive when I come off the stage. <laughs> so I would say access to contemporary technologies has never been more egalitarian than before. When I used to work on mainframe computers, it was a big machine locked in a basement for which if you didn't have a key to access it, you would never be able to do it. It meant that point, some decimal, decimal, zero, 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 one percent of the people would be running the mathematical programs that I used to run. That meant that, and if you wanted to even do a little calculation, you had to write a program to do it. Today, we can get some of the best artificial intelligence to answer one of our questions on almost any research question I want. I can Google almost on any question I want. That means that today, um, the latest technology is so more accessible to the average person around the globe than we could ever believe. I can remember my first phone, um, um, portable phone. It was a luggo, it was this heavy thing. Only a few people had it. Today, around the globe, almost everybody has a phone. The computing power of the average phone today has more computing power than what got Apollo to the moon. 
that means, to me, it's not access to technology that's the challenge. It's what are we using technology to do that is productive for the society. If I take a look at how many people are playing a game on their phones or so on and so on, how many people are using that technology to actually help them to learn, to solve problems, to make a difference in society, that's the imbalance, I would say, not the access. The access problem is material. I'm not underestimating it. Not everybody has access to, um, to the internet or to a computer and so on, but boy, oh boy, relative to when I used to work on mainframe computers, the average person didn't even know what a mainframe computer was um, back then. Um, so, uh, again, as I said, my job is to make sure that I don't get stoned off the stage by such an answer, eh? But you see what I mean, I hope. Thank you. I'll probably ask another question. In the meantime, the audience, um, I'm, I know it's a, quite a lot for you to absorb. It's a very deep conversation. So um, if you have any other questions, please raise your hand. But I'll ask one in the meantime. As a, uh, I know a lot of young people too are asking the same, the same question. Um, how do you see AI affecting uh, young professionals and their being um, their uh, ability to be, employed, to be employed in a few years from now? Um, and how do they prepare um, to face uh, that challenge? What is the biggest challenge you think that young professionals will face? Um, thank you for that question. I think that in the first part of it, uh, and it may sound a little bit ironic, I, I think the first item, the first challenge with all technology is to make sure that fear does not inhibit your ability to actually utilize the technology and see how it can benefit you in being effective at whatever you're doing. So because of that, quite often we look at new technology with almost this arm lens fear that means that we don't investigate, we don't start looking at what it can do and so forth. So that's the first one. Um, to embrace the technology and be curious about new technology because there would always be another technology. Um, the next item is, is to be able to take a look at whatever profession you're in, to already start looking at how is that being used in that field. And that then can actually already tell you that it's being used. So if you write a paper and that paper does spell check or a correction on your grammar, guess what? That's AI. So you're likely already using it, but you didn't actually know that you're using it. So that then says then, if you're already using it, the question is how can you use more and how can you be effective? But my answer, lastly, is what I said before, is to remember that learning isn't about the stock of stuff you know. It is the process by which you know. So to use AI, as a process of getting answers to solutions as opposed to thinking of it as the stock of what I know would be my last part. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening. As I listened to your presentation, I couldn't help but wonder if Schumpeter ever thought that the concept of creative destruction would become so rapid. Um, but more seriously, uh, my colleague talked about concerns about getting people to work in a certain way. And I wondered how, what are your views on balancing the relationship between trust and monitoring? Say again. Between trust and monitoring, trust especially, and yes. Okay. Because there is an element of remote work. Um, that a typical employer thinks needs to be monitored in multiple ways. Yeah. But as you pointed out, um, I think one needs to balance a relationship between trust and monitoring. So I'd like to hear your views on that. Okay. So uh, trust and monitoring is a really interesting item. And um, some years ago, I wrote a paper on monitoring. And um, it was a mathematical model on monitoring and the question is, could I get to a perfect monitoring um, state? 
And what that means is if monitoring has any cost attached to it, as I try to get to a perfect monitoring state, you end up with a cost structure that becomes infinite. That means that the individual collectively, from a game theoretic point of view, know you can't perfectly monitor. So as a result, they have an incentive to stress the system to the point for which you give up monitoring. <laughs> okay? So softly put. So I said to myself, we have about 5,000 people that are employed by our college. And that's a, that's a low number. It's more than 5,000 people. So I asked myself the question, could I monitor all of them? And I came to the conclusion, I can't stand over everybody's shoulder. So now then, the question is, what is the shared strategy, shared vision, shared impact, shared values, shared mission? And that then says that I could spend less energy, less cost on monitoring and a lot of time getting strategic alignment across the institution. And if I can get that, then people will be committed to moving the mountain in a way that I could not monitor them to see if they move the pedal. Yeah, it, right? But all that being said, the question is, um, I spoke to someone here um, who is in IT and IT security. If I was in IT security, then I definitely want to track and monitor the hacks and malicious intent that's coming in. So that then says that while I may mention that as it relates to teams, the smaller the cohort of team and shared interests, the less I want to monitor. And the more the divergence in interest there is, the more I want to monitor. So that then says that you're right, that there is this balance between um, outcome and monitoring, and that's always there in that sense. I, I hope that, that that duality of an as almost like a contradiction, but I, I hope it's, it's clear. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, good night, uh, Dr. Ferran. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I want to bring us back a little bit to the latter part of your presentation where you talked about economic growth and you brought it back to um, Guyana. And uh, from the data, it does appear as though opportunities for work have expanded. Our unemployment rates have declined, though, of course, not as much as our economic growth would have uh, expanded. But what we see in Guyana is that these are accompanied by widespread polarization um, and income stagnation. And that is leading to some level of um, discontent and, of course, social unrest. And so how, how do we address this? How, as an institution, um, how does education address this? How, as a society and a country, do we, do we address this? Thanks. Uh, thank you for that. One of the interesting um, items, and it happened in 1955, and it was a book by Sir Arthur Lewis, on economic growth in which one of his chapters was on human capital. Um, then the other part of human capital in the 1980s that generated an area that kind of stands between mathematics and economics called endogenous growth. And the idea was if you could get people to come together, the aggregate of their human capital generated this huge growth in the economy. And what that also says is if education is polarized only amongst a few, that you're getting a sub-performance to the whole capacity of the society. So whatever performance you're getting, you're getting 38% GDP growth. Your growth has 300% increase in five years. Those numbers are off the chart. What I'm saying is those numbers under-define what the society is actually capable of. 
So that then says that the idea of accessible education, inclusive education, um, it means then that not only do you need a PhD program here, you also need a way of, of having a vocational education program. You don't just need a vocational education program, you need a pathway for that student who left high school. Um, that means then that the education system has to then create pathways for broadening that base of people who can be a part of that human capital network. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be everything to everyone. Um, but as a leading institution, you can actually both partner or build component parts or incentivize component parts that allow more and more individuals to be a part of it. Here's an example, and I'm going back to the question about how do parents support children. That means that in um, Ontario, we have a um, take a child to work day. Do you, I don't know if you have that here. Do you have that here? Okay. So we have take a child to work day. I also have, how about take a child and a neighbor's child to work day? See? And somebody might say, well, why? Because what you're doing in that exposure, you're saying to that child, this, when I'm away, this is what I'm doing. But this is, look at the possibilities. Lastly, and you know, Jamaican parents, so I wouldn't necessarily say I would go tell anyone to replicate my upbringing, um, you know, um, in that sense. Um, because Jamaican parents are, they are loving on one hand, but they are tough on the other. Um, but I remember we were immigrants to Canada, and my parents had a little saying when they got home. They go, when we go to work, we get paid to be able to do this for you. When you go to school, your job is to earn marks to do that for us. Right? So I think then for an institution, when you work, who are you doing it for? You're doing it for the nation. And that then says creating pathways and capacity to be able to include everybody in the nation means that whatever performance in GDP and growth you're generating, man oh man, just imagine if you had the full capacity of the society engaged in the prosperity of the society. And that to me should be a social mission of an institution and a society. It doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. It doesn't mean it won't trip. It doesn't mean it won't fall. It doesn't mean it's not starting from somewhere. But if there isn't a goal, then there isn't a strategy. Yeah. I hope my, I hope my question, uh, my answer helped on that question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Have um, any other question online, Tara? Or is there any other question from the audience? Oh, uh, Dr. Murray. Our Professor Firon, I, um, I listened to you and very fascinating presentation. And I keyed in on this whole aspect of working from home. And so in your experience, when persons started to work at home, did they have to be like the carpenter who to build a house, he has to have his tools? Or was there a role for the college in enabling them to work from home? Yes. So without question, um, there is the obligation of the employer to facilitate the individual to work from home. If the employer and the employee agree that's going to be a part of the condition, right? Because the, the employer could always say there is no working from home, <laughs> right? At which point there's going to be an interesting negotiation, right? So that then says that without question, to me, I always look at all relationships um, as, as a relationship 
that's not short term but long term. So that means that the employer can't make a, a demand that is unreasonable and the employee can't make a demand that is unreasonable. So somewhere in that is the middle ground. So I would say absolutely. So um, by way of example, if somebody's working on a computer from home, that means that that computer better have the um, software to be able to make sure it doesn't get hacked and jeopardize the entire records um, of the uh, university or the college. Um, that's a absolute requirement, not of the employee, but the employer. See what I mean? Um, the individual might be working on, um, on, for me, let's say I'm working on some mathematical programming idea um, or statistical modeling. That means that you want to have the licensing agreement that permits me to work not only at the university but from home on that, in that sense. But I think it, that needs to be a dialogue on, on that item, no different than the dialogue of me saying it's my office and nobody else can share it. Um, I think it's a, it's a dialogue. So I would say individuals need to express what is it they need to be able to be productive by working at home, and then the university or the college needs to express what's its fiscal capacity in order to be able to facilitate that. And that might mean then that the trade-off is that for three days a week or two days a week you're coming into the office because there's a software access or the tool access, so you're doing that kind of work, and then for the other days you're doing things that don't depend on that. or. Um, you're giving up the uh, office space in terms of shared, so the cost structure is not there in order to get the software. In other words, what I trust, I trust if everybody steps into the pool with goodwill, there'll be good outcomes. Yeah. All right, so I hear your response, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking about our circumstances and all that happened when we were trust um, into this whole COVID thing and having to work from home and the like. There were efforts made by our Vice Chancellor to facilitate as far as the budget of the university was able to, um, laptops for people and that kind of thing, phones for people and the like. But there, there are some other things that I, I, I think has to be considered, like, for example, you might be in a home where everybody's there whilst you're mm -hmm. in a meeting, so, you might need to get some special kind of equipment for confidentiality. So I'm thinking that um, not everybody in our context might be able to work from home. Mm -hmm. And so with this whole thing of shared space, lack of resources, I was asking what was your experience and how you dealt with that okay. in your college. Okay, so um, maybe three points I'll make, right? The first one is personal. I have to tell you, I surprised myself. I didn't think I could work from home, right? So I was the, the most surprised person when I found myself being really productive and saying, ah, oh, I actually like working from home. And it wasn't just me working from home, it was Kathy and myself working from home, right? And one of the items is I'm not allowed to work from home generally, and the reason why, because I read the word the, and I'm the most excited kid, and I run up to her and I say, boy, look at this word, it's the. And she going, I'm working, right? So it required a huge change in my behavior to be able to work at home, and all of a sudden I discovered that I was really productive. The second item, though, is that what we noticed in Canada on the data, and the data shows this, is if you take a look at family abuse and abuse of spouses during COVID, it went to the roof. And that means it is not always safe for people to work from home. And that meant then that the idea of somebody saying, I don't want to work from home. As an employer, I needed to make sure that we didn't tell people you must work from home. Because they might not want to tell me why they don't want to work from home. And that means that as an employer, I also need to be cognizant and respect some of their choices. And then ask the question, how do our policies actually admit in 
um, that context. Lastly, I would say um, on equipment and the likes, um, I think that it's not dissimilar to um, any scenario. And I think your example of a carpenter um, is a good example. Um, everybody, if we're going to be productive, then we will need some baseline things. Um, so for example, we might need a cell phone. Does that mean I need to provide you with a cell phone or does that mean I need to be able to cover a portion of your billing in which you use the cell phone for business? It's a lot easier if we do that versus me providing you with a cell phone. See what I mean? Um, in that sense. So I think that we can, as employers, we had to go through and start to think through all of those kinds of items. The other one that was really fun is individuals who got um, transportation allowance during COVID. They were getting transportation allowance, but they're not coming into the work. So you know what the joke was? Do you want to be that person telling somebody you don't get a trans the travel allowance, <laughs> right? So now people are starting to fight you on travel allowance when they're not traveling. Okay, so I think to, from a management point of view in quotes, and I'm always careful about that language in an academic institution, um, I would say everybody needs to pick their battles. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll take the final questions from, from the DVC. Uh, Gobin, Dr. Gobin, please. All right, so my question is, because I was sitting here listening to your presentation, and I'm wondering, is there a future job for me, given this advance in technology? And I'll give you some context to that. Malcolm and I did a course while we were studying, and he said by 2029, it, uh, it, technology will be so advanced that they can do most things that humans can do, but not everything. But by 2040, they'll be able to program computers to do everything that a human can do. So I'm wondering in the future if I have a job, <laughs> given that I'm a business lecturer. <laughs> well, well, as I said, I can remember being that kid in a classroom with a kid with a slate, with paper, to doing programming, on a mainframe computer, all those changes. And every single time there's a change, I saw today when I was um, someone with a horse, a horse and buggy. And the joke of it is that as a family, we have all these stories. So my grandfather had a, bunch of, a whole bunch of horses and a buggy. And the question is, should he buy a truck? And he said, boy, where the truck can go that the horse can't go. So he didn't buy the truck. So you know what happened, eh? Technology went one way, family wealth went the other. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and the reason why I'm a, I'm a prof is because we don't have any land for me to farm. <laughs> okay? So just as a, by the way, okay, intergenerational failure. What I'm getting at is every generation thought that they were going to become obsolete. And every new technology, we are threatened what being irrelevant. I don't, I think it's because we misinterpret the human value and the human being in, and we undervalue the human being. Both our ability to solve problems, our ability to apply technology to new possibilities, and that combination of knowledge and technology to create new transformational constructs that lead to a value proposition. So the challenge is not, to me, about new technology and so forth. It's about how do I think about applying my knowledge and developing and increasing and enhancing my knowledge to be able to apply 
the evolving technology to add social value to society. We said the GDP grew from 6,000, just over 6,000 in 2019 to over 18,000 in 2022, 23. The unemployment level did not. That means that the society has a huge need to take our knowledge and this evolving technology to solve that problem. Because it means then that human problems are not automatically solved by advances in technology, but it's solved by the combination of applying our knowledge and our motives, motivation and technology to solving the human condition. So for me, until the human condition is at such a level of prosperity where one day I got to sleep and I asked the question, why should I wake up, right? Then when I wake up, I think I got work to do. Yeah, so I think we always have work to do and that work may be creativity, maybe it's music, maybe it's poetry, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. But once I go to sleep and I wake up that day, boy, I got work to do. So I don't know what the work might be, but I got work to do. Because the human condition demands me to work to improve the human condition, even if it's one person at a time. And thank you so much. So you raise a very interesting question. Uh, both of you, and, and that is really how we, what, what will we work? And if uh, what we think is work will be work in five years' time. I'm actually looking forward to computers doing everything for me in 2029, 20, so I don't have to work. I could tell you that if it happens tomorrow, I'd be totally happy. <laughs> but this is wonderful. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, could we give the professor another round of applause? And quite, quite fascinating uh, tour of thought through this, uh, this question, uh, which is not going to be settled today. But you've left us a lot to think about and to ponder. And also, there are some of the things you touched on in here. I'd like to offer a disclaimer. I did not discuss these things with him. But clearly, these are things that are in the space of higher education that all or many administrators have to address. So ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure now to invite our Deputy Vice Chancellor for Institutional Advancement, Dr. Melissa Eiffel, to move the closing remarks and the vote of thanks. Dr. Eiffel. You want me to Thank come you down? so much. Um, all protocols have been observed. Um, on behalf of the University of Guyana, I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to you, Dr. Ferran, um, for gracing us with your very, very insightful keynote address on the future of education and work in driving economic growth and development. I found your presentation both stimulating, inspiring, thought-provoking, your understanding of the landscape of education and work coupled with all of the innovations, I'm sure, have left us all with a renewed sense of enthusiasm and purpose. Certainly for me, it has. We are grateful for your knowledge. We are grateful for your insights that you have shared with us. And through your engaging discourse, you have shed a lot of light on the role that we can play in this education space in shaping the economic trajectory of our own nation. Thank you for your emphasis on adaptability, on embracing technology. It's something that our own Vice Chancellor has you know, flagged time and time um, again. And inspiring in us, you know, this spark so that we can strive to embrace change, um, whatever that change might be. So, 
On behalf of us all, I would just like to express our deepest gratitude um, and we look forward to continued collaboration between the University of Guyana and George Brown in thinking through all of these things and helping to solve some of these problems uh, together. I would also like to express our appreciation to all of you here in the audience, um, those in person, those of us who are online, thank you for coming out this evening. I know for some of us it's been a day since early in the morning. I see our personnel and APO. <laughs> I know they have been here since early this morning, so thank you for staying with us um, and gracing us with your presence. I am absolutely sure that we all had um, a stimulating time today and that you have absolutely no regret for coming. Thank you to our Vice Chancellor for chairing the session, uh, to Jai for um, moderating the question and answer aspect of the program, for all those who would have organized um, DEC, PACE, uh, Maintenance Department, um, your continued hard work and your excellence in terms of delivering and discharging your duties, they are noted and they are also appreciated and commended. So thanks once again, Dr. Ferron, for your exceptional presentation tonight. Um, and we look forward to hosting you time and time again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you all.